Coffee and Nun at that time, and later Ban Ki Moon, to be the head of UNUSA, United Nations Outer Space Office for Outer Space, UNUSA. We are very proud indeed of you, Dato. And along the way, you had been appointed DDG, yeah. Deputy Director General of IAEA, of, of the Vienna Office of the United Nations. There you go, many accomplishments. Plus, she is also responsible to bring in the program of sending the first Malaysian astronaut. That was 2007? 2007. You see, a lot of firsts for Mazlan Osman, including later, she will also deliberate on the science and arts interaction and so on. So now it's 1.38, enough from me. Without much further ado, let's listen on the great overview first of science and cities and other matters relevant to it. Silakan, Professor Emeritus Mazlan Osman. Thank you, thank you, Mazlin. Uh, old friend, very old friend, we go back many years, we've done so many things uh, in uh, all aspects of sustainability, although we did not quite call it such, eh? we did not quite call it sustainability, but it was always what sustainable development. Yeah, Lestari, I'm so proud that Lestari started in uh, UKM, uh, one of the very first multidisciplinary uh, departments that dealt with this issue. And so that's why they always have a head start over others. Um, okay, um, I'm very honored to be here today and to be invited by you all to speak on cities. Um, ap apologies first, because Maslin is so well dressed and I'm like, uh, <laughs> and this is where I make a pitch, eh? because I've just come from the art science uh, meeting where we are trying to uh, create a movement amongst the artists and scientists to be working at the interface between arts and science. And so today, for the first time ever in the history of our country, uh, not the first, we are having an exhibition of art science works. And we're hoping to get uh, somebody who will win the prize and residencies and all that. But again, we are hoping that this will become a movement in our country. And uh, as Nizam uh, said to me a few days ago that he wanted to talk to me about uh, the culture, uh, the arts in a city, because I think this maybe we will um, cover further, that the soul of a city is in its arts and culture. Without soul, you may have the best water, best uh, renewable energy, but where is that soul? So I'd love to talk to you, Asmizam, about uh, the arts and science and the importance of uh, culture in, in a city. I mean, if you remember London, you don't you remember the arts, I mean, this, uh, the, the culture, you know? Okay, there are some nice buildings, but we remember, uh, we know London by its uh, culture. Okay, so today, Maslin, I thought what I could do usefully is to bring us through the big picture of sustainability and then I'll zero in to cities, only at the Asia Pacific level, and then we go down to Southeast Asia. And then we say, what are the problems? Because I think until we know what is that big picture and where we are not yet uh, progressing, and you'll see the, the bad news, um, then it's, you know, uh, it's hard for us to uh, pick out what are the things that we should be dealing with. Okay, so let me start. Uh, um, do I? Do I? Oh. Uh, no, let, let me do that. Nothing. Okay. I, I need some because I can't remember all the seventeen SDGs. So <laughs> I, <have a laughs> so that's what my file is about. Um, so there are those seventeen sustainable development goals. There is, um, if you go to Google, there are so many images. But we love this. Oh, by the way, I'm from the office for the regional office for the International Science Council, ISC, and we are the office for Asia and the Pacific. So I have a fabulous team. I have a dream team of four people. Yes, and uh, so we love this uh, diagram because it shows you how interrelated this 
goals are. And uh, I think that was what maybe was the problem with the MDGs. With the MDGs, we didn't see the interactions, and that's why some were never accomplished. But here, um, with the SDGs, we are clearer about that, and the ISC is doing a lot of work uh, in looking at what those interactions are and how those uh, targets or indicators may actually have to change now uh, because of these uh, intense uh, interactions now. Okay, and so because of this huge interaction, we cannot have a single uh, disciplinary approach. And we have to think about a whole systems approach. But here, because we are talking about, we're going to be talking about cities later on, I'm looking at the systems approach from the city point of view. So you look at that urban system, there are all those uh, multiple parameters, the different actors, the structures, the processes, the linkages, and the functions. And that, and every one of those, is inbuilt into each system again the physical system, the socio-economic system, and the ecological system. And all of this interact. But then, it's not cities don't exist by themselves. They are part uh, of a much bigger system. And so you see the cities as part of an open system, where there is national, regional, global influences, how cities affect these, how these affect cities. Um, then there is the rural and peri-urban areas. But you know that cities, uh, if you look at cities in terms of their GDP, they are bigger than a lot of countries. Um, the biggest consumer of energy is cities, not countries. Uh, the biggest consumer of um, food, cities, not, con not countries. Uh, so cities by themselves uh, need to be looked on you know, within this even bigger context. And, and then not only that, we are also talking about mega cities now. Um, and so uh, the whole country might become sort of city uh, in the future. So this is the systems approach um, the ISC uh, advocates. And from time to time, we hold workshops on this uh, just to give you a pitch of uh, what we do. Okay, so my the next thing I would like to do with you all is to give you an overview of um, SDGs and how, they how well... Uh, how well have, are we doing in terms of achieving those SDGs? I won't look at the global one, Maslin. I will look at the Asia-Pacific one. And this came from this report. If you would, uh, Google this, you get all these fabulous results, you know? And this is the 2020 report. And um, I hope you can see that there is not, yeah, there is not a single, um, uh, in, uh, um, b uh, goal that we are anywhere nearing the target, even the 2019 target. And then now with the COVID-19, there is no way we are going to achieve any of the targets, even if so I'll show you later, maybe some we are on the way, but we have uh, definitely regressed. And then what, uh, the worst thing is you look at those red uh, the, the red bars, that is actually where we have actually regressed. <laughs> Not, let alone, uh, you know, achieve uh, some current target, but we have regressed. And that would be, shame, shame on us, responsible consumption and production. That means we're buying too many TVs, too many shoes. <laughs> I stopped buying shoes and clothes, really. <laughs> and uh, maybe less seriously, but climate action. And, you know, this is where our duty to the young people is that is dealing with uh, climate change. And even, okay, then we look at cities. Where is the Asia the specific in terms of cities? You see that, yeah, we look positive, but Maslin, because you're close by, um, actually we're only second guessing that we are there. You see that is insufficient indicators or what this means is we don't have sufficient data. And, the, and, and uh, so keep that in mind because I'm going to uh, talk more about that uh, later. Okay, I, I don't think I'll go through the SDGs, but just in case afterwards somebody asks, we already have the slide, eh? uh, Maslin, on, on hand for us. What are the targets? Um, interesting targets, but uh, we'll see how far we'll go there. Okay, now, 
I want you to look at the SDGs well. This is a snapshot of some of the SDGs at the Asia Pacific level and how well we are doing in terms of cities. Now remember, Asia Pacific includes China, Japan, Korea, Singapore, um, Papua New Guinea, Myanmar, Cambodia. Um, so it looks like from the Asia Pacific uh, standpoint, we are actually uh, we are going to maintain the target for housing and basic services. I think this uh, is quite simple. This one we are building houses. It's quite easy to build houses, so uh, we seem to be there. Public transport system, we are not quite there, but if we keep going, we will be able to achieve some of the targets. I think. Same with urban air quality and waste management. Okay, remember this includes India as well. Huh? But where are we regressing, Muslim? This is your business here, resilience to disasters. That's Lestari's uh, bread and butter uh, business. Um, so um, why on earth is that? You know? But then if we look uh, down about uh, urbanization, urban planning, um, and the one I like best is the cultural and natural heritage. It's grey. So I tell you already why it's grey, because it cannot be measured. It cannot be measured because there's no data, blah, blah, blah. But again, I'll come back to that um, in a little bit. So we're not doing well uh, there. But of course, if we look at the other goals, um, we might not be doing so badly, you know, but because cities, uh, th there's a lot of investment in, in cities. Okay, so let me now look at Southeast Asia, our neighbours and ourselves. Uh, first of all, I have to tell you that this data is based on uh, Southeast Asian countries minus Malaysia. Yes, we, we, uh, our office was at, um, in Thailand, in Bangkok, yeah. where clearly um, Malaysia did not submit our data. As Nizam, I think you have to find out why. But it's not only cities, but everything else. Uh, so uh, I'm tra I think we should sh be ashamed that um, Malaysia, where everybody expects us to be, you know, uh, engaged, advanced, we did not provide data. Tapi tak apalah. I'm sure you know where we are. But let's look at the Southeast Asia. Uh, same trends. Um, but you see the reduced, but where, where are we bad in? That is in the reduced inequalities uh, in terms of uh, a target and surprise, surprise, peace, justice and strong institutions. Yeah. So uh, we really need to look at this. Why are we regressing Southeast Asia? Only 10, ten countries can. Um, uh, in the issue of peace, justice, and strong institutions. I don't know, if you're looking at some of the political upper right now, uh, it might be <laughs> some part of that explanation. But, so you see, that's the Southeast Asia. But the good news is, you see, we are meeting the target, Muslim, for quality education. Uh, with all the good universities and all that, yep, we are uh, uh, exceeding the target for 2019. We are just meeting the target for industry, innovation and infrastructure, which is again terrific. Um, but yeah, we need to worry a bit about peace, justice and institutions. Climate action is not so bad because, you know, for the uh, Southeast, for the whole of Asia and Pacific, we were bad in climate action as well as uh, responsible consumption and production. So, you know, at the Asia Pacific level, uh, the achievements are different, but the Southeast Asia is also different. Now, for those of you who are interested in the other regions like the Pacific Islands, please go to the report. Fantastic report there. I mean, uh, you, you I could talk about that by itself, but please just go to, to that report. Okay, now I'm comparing for cities, yeah? Muslim, for cities, Asia Pacific and Southeast Asia. So just now we saw that housing and basic services, memang kita dah okay, and yes, Southeast Asia pun okay. But look, where public transport systems as a whole, remember this is China, Japan, Korea, we are not there. We are regressing in terms of the public transport systems. So as soon as you take China and Japan with their you know, wonderful uh, city infrastructure, Southeast Asia, we are regressing. And then, 
Okay, uh, Asia Pacific as a whole, urban air, air quality of waste management is expected. You know the brown cloud that you see from satellites above uh, India, above China. This is uh, a big problem, and apparently Southeast Asia too. And maybe this uh, sometimes it's because of our haze and all that. Oh, I see it's 152. I better hurry. Uh, and then uh, resi resilience to disasters, Muslim, bad news. We are still red. So you, you need uh, fit three needs to uh, st uh, stand up to this and, 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 and look at the issues again. But then you see it's all gray, gray because we have no data. And I'm going to sing this song. Ni macam broken record lah, Maslin. I keep saying this, yeah. Okay, what am I supposed to talk about next? Okay, okay. Now I want to look at the reverse trends. Eh? But the reverse trends uh, of all the SDGs, but which ones? actually affect the cities. So in the reverse trend for Southeast Asia as a whole, you can see um, target th uh, SDG 3, 7, 8, etc. is all there. But then, this is about interrelations, eh, Masli? If you look at uh, 3.52, we are very badly regressing in the harmful use of alcohol. I would say it is a city's problem. I and mean, why are people going to the bars regardless of the MCO, you know, and uh, risking everything? And then renewable energy share. That, that uh, you know, as I said, uh, cities are one of the biggest uh, consumers of energy, real GDP. Again, as I said, cities are supposed to be the richest uh, entities in the world. And look, in Southeast Asia, we are regressing in terms of the real GDP per capita growth. But these are for LBCs. Eh? And then refugees, okay? Um, maybe they're not coming from Myanmar as a whole, but ref, uh, you know, ref, uh, people coming from the semi-urban and, uh, and, and rural areas. We have to talk about that too. And then the population living below 50%, we are regressing, it's getting worse. Um, intentional homicides, uh, suicides, uh, malnutrition, okay, there, economic loss from disasters again. Uh, again, another, another uh, 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 on disasters, economic losses, the material footprint. Remember, we're very bad on the consumption, irresponsible consumption, uh, going backwards. Road traffic deaths, of course, they're all in cities. So, and, so, and we are regressing there. Right? And sulfur dioxide is air pollution. So, the, but this this you won't see in the as in the targets for cities. But you have to look at this yeah. when you're looking at cities. This is what I mean by the interactions, and these are in fact extremely important. It's not about whether you have an urban planning department in the country. So, if you're not looking at this, you're not going to be meeting your targets. So th these are some of the issues we should be looking at when we're looking at cities, not just that seven, I think, um, targets yang bawah cities. So. Okay, now why am I showing this? Eh? I'm showing this, it can be anything, it can be Southeast Asia or Asia Pacific. If you look at the dominant color there, that dominant color is gray, kan, Muslim? That dominant color, not for the father, yeah. but the dominant color is gray, which means that we don't data and uh, um, to me you the, a lot of these things might even be second guessing what is really happening because we don't have data and so we in the cities especially we have this and the SDGs in general a data conundrum so how are we going to know when we're going to meet the, those uh, targets in 2030 or in 2050 or never because we don't have that data. And, and in talking about the data conundrum, uh, must be, I'd, like, I'd like to say that um, the if you look at the US, they have lots of data. I mean, like for instance, the data on employment. The presidents uh, of uh, the United States, they time their, um, their announcements of things based on the, the, the employment data. In the, the employment statistics, they wait sometimes. They know already for three days, but they wait, and then they will say it is bad or good, uh, depending on what they want to achieve. This is how good the data collection is. Now, I, I've done this. I, I didn't do it for everything, but I did it for the creative industry in Malaysia like four years ago, and I found out two things. One is 
we have sometimes we have data. Okay, we don't have data. But what, when the whatever data we have all comes under the Official Secrets Act. So dapatlah data ni seronok lah ni nak, nak analyze. And then the rahsia, rahsia, rahsia. So when it came to um, making recommendations, we had to do gen in general terms. We could not publish that data. Uh, even though we did projections, it was all like hidden so that we did not you know, violate the Official Secrets Act. So, so there are two things there. There's where the policy comes in. One is we must enact laws. In fact, I think it is law that uh, people must provide data. Because without the law, nobody really, I mean, we just, say it's a guideline, you, you can give it to us or not, then I think it's not going to be effective. So there has to be a, a law. And also, maybe we have to change some parts of our law for, ah, maybe we should change some parts of our laws uh, for uh, making sure we get the data that can be distributed. And then when we talk about data, this is where your data scientists and the scientists come in as a whole. I think we can uh, talk about it more where the scientists <coughs> can come in, but it's the scientists that are going to help you develop uh, maybe sub-indicators because some of these indicators are too big, you might need other things, and some of those indicators might have to be localized, but it's your scientists, the social scientists and the um, the, the natural scientists that are going to help the cities uh, deal with um, this issue. Okay, I, that's, a, that's all I have to say for now on, on this before we go on to the, um, the, the, the other issues. But uh, uh, Maslin, allow me for two minutes to tell you about something that I think cities should be looking at. That's bamboo. <laughs> and um, because uh, bamboo is the most sustainable material in the world, this is grass, huh? uh, the, the fastest growing plants in the world uh, are bamboo. As I said, you can grow bamboo anywhere. And look that it is as good as steel in terms of its physical characteristics. And I want to go way over the top, bamboo city. So, you know, and not in a bamboo city on land, but because m bamboo is so light and everybody's talking about building on water these days or maybe even underwater, there you go, floating cities made of bamboo. But that, that is only my hobby. <laughs> Hopefully I can get a question of bamboo. Wow, okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful presentation by Emeritus Professor Datuk Mazlan Osman. Thank you so much. Yes, this morning also during the high-level dialogue, from 11.30 to about 1 o'clock. Mm. We also mentioned and shared some of the SDG indicators for yes. our country. Yeah. Thank you for zooming in on Asia Pacific and mm. Southeast Asia. Mm. So Malaysia was excluded from that data because As we don't because give data Because we didn't at all. give data, yes, yes. Or is it because of the Secrecy Act? That I, I don't know. Don't because know. you do have an SDG, what do you call that? Uh, secretariat. That just this report, right? Mm, and um, yes. hands it over to, I think, maybe New York. Right. But UNS cap definitely hasn't captured it. And maybe it was late and, you know, uh, we, they did not manage to capture it on time. So maybe some of our colleagues from Urbanist can yeah, capture might, this might and convey find out to why? the Secretary yeah. General so mm. that Malaysia will not be lagging in terms of giving the data, data? on time. On yep, time. Yep, yep. Because on the SDG for the country as a whole, there yes. are two indicators. I can remember which SDG, which we are given a dot. That means we did not give data at all. Mm, mm. So, but okay. one good thing about Malaysia, Department of uh, Statistics Malaysia, mm. uh, in fact, last year produced a initial uh, data on 232, 232 indicators of DG, Department of Statistics. Mm under mm. Datuk Sri Uze as the yes, Director General. Yeah, right, so yeah. at least the Department of Statistics is taking measure okay. and uh, acknowledging that yeah, yeah, we need we to need compile this data. It's good to know. Good to know. Good. So Datuk, you had been in the satellite remote sensing mm. uh, area for yeah. quite some time. 
uh, in these modern times, this is where valuable data could come right, from. Right, right. Even if Malaysia keep it a secret, yes. other country can <laughs> send satellite and remote yes, sensing. Yes, yes, yeah. So within this context, maybe yeah. you can share a yeah, little bit yeah, about the potential yeah. of satellites right, and remote right. sensing? Uh, first, first, the general issue of uh, satellite imagery. You know, if uh, 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 people say, and you might not believe it because you think that uh, satellites can read the um, car plate numbers. Um, <laughs> but actually, if somebody from the satellite wants to read your car plate number, they can do that. Although I would say that they wouldn't do that too often because it's very expensive to do that. So this whole thing about not being, not making our data, I mean our satellite data available it, to Malaysians, for instance, is ridiculous because they can go elsewhere. They can go to uh, the US or Singapore. Singapore has the best data on us. And they just buy that data and they analyze it as they wish. But I think there is a certain mindset that we are not able to overcome. I, as an example, Mazdin, when I was in the United Nations, every year, without fail, somebody in the, um, from the countries will stand up and say, I would like to uh, propose that we ban Google Maps. Yeah, they don't want Google Maps <laughs> because they said that uh, it, will, will, it will be revealing, you know, uh, very, very sensitive data. I mean, it's the horse has bolted from the barn. I mean, so why are we trying to um, ban uh, this sort of data? But I think it is good, it is for public very good because it, it makes everybody transparent, yeah? It makes governments transparent, uh, and you have to answer uh, to, uh, to the images that people see. And then governments sometimes give you another figure for their forests. Somebody else gives another figure for their forests. Good, we can, we can debate. Huh? Before, nobody would debate with the country because uh, you know, it's like a um, secret number already. But no, uh, countries now, governments have to be very, very uh, aware that the public is looking at them. Yeah. And it's good. So if I may share a little bit more with you, mm. and you give a little bit of assessment, how mm. good are our satellites? You launch the Tiong Sat, uh, yeah, yeah. and so on. Uh, so give yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> some so updates. I, I'm so embarrassed to say this, but uh, Tiong Sat was never meant as an operation satellite. It was a technology demonstration satellite. Its uh, um, resolution was about 30 meters. So today, uh, Maslin, you won't get much out of that. But the good thing is that today, with the b small satellites like uh, even Razak Sat, you can get uh, resolutions as good as any of the big satellites uh, 30 years ago because there's miniaturization of all things, you know, computers and whatnot. So our second satellite was Razak Sat. Unfortunately, Razak Sat had a very, very special mission because it was um, um, orbiting the Earth at the equator. It is, still it is, it is, just it's not operating. But the reason we did that, to put it at the equator, is because if we put it at the equator, then we can see the same satellite 14 times a day for our own decision making, compared to when the French uh, launched their satellites from pole to pole, and we see it once every few days. Um, but of course, there was a technical glitch, and um, as I said, never quite uh, functioned as it should. So yeah, but we, we, uh, we need to solve our problems ourselves. The French are not going to um, launch a satellite to solve our problems. But the problem why we went to the uh, equator was because mm, at that time there was the haze in 1997, and I remember Mahathir was then the prime minister. He called everybody, uh, including your security council, national, yes. He asked everybody, what, can you, what do you bring to the table? And he looked at me and said, okay, now with the satellite data, what can we do with the satellite data? And all I could say was we, we can have um, spots, hot spots. But then it's not enough for the, for the bomber to go there and fight that fire because we didn't have that resolution. We only knew it within like five kilometers. That's no good for firefighting. And therefore, we, we need our own satellite with our own resolution to solve our own problems. Yeah, so, so 
not only to be dependent, too much over dependent on satellites, ah, that's right. on the ground on the and ground, the manual way, yes. traditional way, what would the advice be coming from ICSU? Yes. Executive uh, director. So, uh, I shouldn't be talking purely as a space person, eh? right. but if you have a problem, like you want to see what is uh, what sort of agriculture, this precision agriculture, or uh, looking at illegal immigrants, look at the problem first. And what is the what is the scope of that problem? Then you go to the technology solution. And a satellite may not be the sol only solution. Um, and uh, that's why sometimes, uh, even though when I was in the space agency, I always said, no, 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 satellites are there uh, to actually support other uh, data generating mechanisms. And um, But satellites are good because then if it's very high up, you always have the big picture. And remember, we are talking about climate change today as a global problem. Why? Because we can see the Earth as a planet. Yeah. And how did we manage to do that? Through satellites. So satellites have a very, very important role to play. And in climate change, you cannot not have satellites. We must invest in satellites. But if you're going to be talking about precision agriculture in MOA, um, then maybe you don't need satellites. You just need drones. And now there's another solution called high altitude platforms, which are about 22 uh, kilometers or so in the stratosphere. And you can make it hover. But there are many solutions. And I wouldn't say satellites are the only solution when it comes to decision making. Okay, we get it. It must be a combination yes. between. Uh, very high technology, yes. medium technology, uh, yes, and even, yes. uh, and even you technology. and I making pencil notes, you know. That's right. <laughs> what about citizen science? Oh yes, ah. that's where the si that's where the notes come in. Yeah, and and so uh, satellite data, drone data is one thing, but you need to verify those, and um, so you've got to have people on the ground. But when you talk about citizen science, it's not just only about verifying data. They feel they fulfill a very important gap. You know, I, when I was in Fiji, uh, Sufian will remember this. That there was this group of people who wanted to look at water pollution, and of course they don't have the things to measure a pH and, uh, and all that. You know, so what they did was they got the school children, the machi machi, the pachi pachi. They, whenever they can, they go and sample the water, but it's not for pH uh, or chemistry. They look at the small uh, organisms, the organisms. So they know that if they are no longer seeing this kind of organism, then it's severe. And if they still can uh, see this, then we are okay. But it's all at citizen science level. And, and it was so fascinating. And I think here we can do the same, except that sometimes we are all so dependent on government, local government, big government, providing all of that data. It need not be that way. And I love for citizen science to come into the fore soon. Mm. So, rightly so, because just now Dato shared that Malaysia performed very well in terms of education. Yes, there you go. Yes, that means right. that our schools right. and universities That's are true. performing well. That's true. Mm. So that is an important yes. resource and talent. Right, Any right. advice of what the teachers and the lecturers and the researchers should they, do? They, they, they can do uh, yes, thank you, Muslim, for that segue. So, you, scientists, they have to come up with this, uh, I wouldn't say cheap, uh, but inexpensive ways of um, developing these indicators. <laughs> okay, so your indicator is not perfect and maybe uh, the, the United Nations cannot use it, but in terms of in being indicative, you know, are we having a problem or not? I think that's good enough. And uh, I remember I was in this group called Urban Urban Group under Professor Shamsani a long time ago. And we had no money in Muslim, absolutely no money for research. I mean, people are so spoiled these days. Um, I, you know, we all had to pay for everything. And so we thought about ways of like this, how to look at the water using dustbins and whatnot. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And but now you all go with your lovely kids and yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. We, we did a lot of those fun things uh, before. But that would be part of citizen science. So in a way, Dato Mazlan is encouraging us and throwing the challenge to be innovative yes, and creative definitely. with whatever little resource you mm, have. Mm. She's also leading uh, at Academy Sciences Malaysia 
the mega science project. Yes, for science. Maybe you'd like yeah, yes. to share? Oh, yeah. So, uh, for science. I, I thank you for talking about for science because today we were, I was walking with a group, my art science uh, people, and they were saying, ah, why didn't we see this coming? I said, you're wrong. Many scientists have already seen this coming. If you do any foresight, if you uh, go to any foresight report on Google, you'll see there one of the black swans is a pandemic. And of course, a collapse, um, economic collapse. But pandemics are always there. Uh, it's just that we, you know, some hubris where we think, ah, this will never happen to us, or it might happen to Africa, like the Ebola, it will never happen to us. But look, and I, I'm so scared that we might have to go through another MCO, Muslin, and I'll miss seeing you all again, yeah? Mm. Maybe mm. you describe a little bit your mega, mega science project yes. version 3.0. Yes. Uh, any speci special aspects yeah, um, of cities inside there? Uh, for us, uh, in our uh, in Mega Science 3.0, tak the cities per se, but but we did uh, the trans uh, automotive, okay. and you know automotives are mainly driven in the um, in the cities. But uh, Mega Science 2 dealt with infrastructure and transportation system and housing as well. Eh? That was a very good uh, 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 report, eh? and. Um, we know that when, it talk, when we talk about transportation systems in, in the cities, it's about being mobile, not in terms of mobile, kaki, jalan, mobile, but mobile in terms of your social standing and all that. Because what would uh, give you mobility in social standing is if you can get a job somewhere that you normally would not because you don't have a car. You know, so the concept of mobility here it goes beyond the train and the car or even the bus. Um, so it's called intelligent mobility. And of course, all these things about flying cars and uh, driverless cars. I love to see in the future, I love not ever having to drive ever again in KL. <laughs> yeah, so um, th it's all about intelligent mobility in, in terms of transportation system. And that we did in Make a Science 2, I think. Uh, you shared very interesting indicators, sub-indicators for uh, Asia and uh, Asia Pacific and then mm. Southeast Asia. Uh, it triggered a thinking upon ourselves here that imagine we are a mayor of a city mm. or we are the district office of a district in Malaysia. Yep. Also, I wish if I'm a DO, I wake up every morning, I can switch on certain gadgets yeah, and I can, yes, see can see the yeah. SDG performance yes. of my district. Yes, yes. Yeah. Have you ever imagined that, Dato? Yes, and and how can we arrive at that mm, point? At that, that point, uh, uh. there has to be, uh, I think we have discussed this at Destari many, many years ago. It goes from the national to the state and to the local level. Unless you get down to the local level, local schools, uh, local um, organizations, you won't get that sort of granularity. Because it much to have um, the government put a, a mm, sensor for PM 2.5, for instance. And there are so many ways um, we talk about citizen science. We can now distribute cheap 2.5, uh, I mean, uh, the particulate uh, a sensors. And then, although, as I said, you're not going to get precise. You're not going to get a PhD out of it, maybe. But I mean, it's a different kind of PhD. But you can see where Ampang is worse than, than PJ, for instance, you know? Um, and, and so the mayor knows that th these are the, the areas you must target. But it, does, um, it doesn't have to come right from the federal government. A, a, a lot of this, the local uh, governments can do, can put in place, yeah, with with the help of the scientists. Well, yeah. This morning, in my ten minutes sharing with them, I also say that hey, uh, local authority, the leaders of local mm. authority, please take that leadership. But you are not alone. Look yes. around. Around you, where are the nearest universities? Where mm. are the nearest experts? Mm, mm. Be you know that yes, experts yeah. may also be in the private sector right, right. or community yes, or NGO. Yeah. So you have travel. Asia Pacific, 50 countries. Iksu takes care of about 50 countries. Mm, no, and 23, 22. Oh, now there's no only, only 22. Okay, sorry. 22. Yeah, but you, had, you have traveled many places. Yes. 
anywhere you have met a mayor or leader of a district whereby they utilize simple signs so that they can manage mm. that district uh, or city yeah. better. Unfortunately, Maslin, I, that we, that's unfortunate about us. We cannot go down to that decision-making level. Eh? Uh, but as I said, uh, at the, you, you, you see the problem? We, at the, the best experts are where? They're at the federal level. Whew, all sophisticated, all international, you know. They must so they believe it's one canal. Uh, this is a person on biodiversity, for instance. And then you go down to the state level. Who's there? Uh, maybe the Department of Geology, and the geologists do a few, and then biodemon at the state level. And then you go down to the local level, nobody, none. But that's where the, the, the expertise should be focused on. And so that we have to change. And then I don't know, Lama Zdi, no, that was what, 20 years ago we discussed this problem? Is it still like that? Still like oh that. So God. that's why my <laughs> encouragement to myself yeah, and my yeah. colleagues at university, we hmm. must also take proactive action yes, to yeah. approach the district leaders yes. and local authority sure. leaders. Mm. Um, uh, this a bit worrying, you see, because Asia Pacific, 80% uh, of the world population, the poverty level is in Asia Pacific. 85%. Ah, there you go. Yeah, well, it's in the tropics. Sorry, so but if we are not there. prepared for yeah. disaster preparedness, mm, mm. Uh, including you know climate change, yes, yeah. disaster related disasters right, right. and all that. So what would be your call to leaders of cities and districts in Malaysia and similar developing countries? Yeah, uh, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia. So my my major call in the in this particular sense is for us to get a better understanding the basic data of our cities. But okay, let's talk about cities, and uh, w um, we cannot be talking about good decision making, development of indicators, and all that until we have this data. Is I wouldn't say even a chick, uh, okay, maybe it's a chicken egg situation, but without that, nothing goes. And um, we have to invest the resources in that. Yeah. So if we turn or go towards education, 10,000 mm. schools around Malaysia yes. and universities are already established right, right. in all states in Malaysia. Yes. yes. So maybe we begin they from there. Be yeah? that, we should begin from there. should be a part of that yes. solution. Eh? Yeah, mm. should be part. Yeah. Combining science and technology mm. with social science, science and humanity. Yes. Ah, this is close that to is your perfect. heart. Perfect. Ah, yeah. So how? And the arts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it, 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 uh, it's a no brainer that any problem at all needs the heart and the soul of all kinds of people. The, the more varied the people you put around the table, the more you can uh, wrap yourself around any particular problem. And to just talk to policy makers, no. Scientists, no. You need to talk to the Pachi Pachi. When we had a uh, when we had a webinar on mangroves, Maslin, we call orang yang pecakap tangkap ikan tu, the people who are catching the fish. What is their problem, you know? And then we, we are next week, oh no no, three days from now, I'm having a we are having a webinar on coffee because it's part of International Coffee Day, and we're going to be talking to baristas, we're going to be talking to local uh, cafes, uh, cafe owners. We want to see what is their problem when it comes to coffee. And someone from Brazil is going to talk about um, climate change and coffee. Uh, but you know, you have to go right down to the people uh, with the with the responsibility. Yeah, the small small holders uh, who are. Um, contributing to this GDP of the country. Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Yeah, this we can morning, ask questions. Right? Maybe yeah. get ready. One or two yeah. questions from the audience. Yes. But this morning we were discussing about pollution getting uh -huh. more oh yes, frequent in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. The treatment mm -hmm. has to be shut down and all that. So obviously we need to do more and more engage with the mm. business and mm. industrial mm. community. Mm. Any special formula? Or way that Itsu would handle mm, this? No, to bring in sorry, sorry, Masli. I, I don't think I have the expertise in that. But uh, I think, uh, um, in terms of uh, what I said before, 
you know, how you bring the expertise in at all the different levels, and the people living along the river, yeah, that citizen science uh, portion of it. That's important, yeah. Maybe one question or two from the those who are present in this auditorium. Maybe we have some online questions. Ah, some there? online? If yeah. anybody monitoring the Zoom? Go to the chat. Ah, go to the chat the Zoom, and Zoom, go chat and see if there are questions. All right. Uh, I'll just read it through here if we can. Ah. All right. So there's question one from uh, Mustafa Kamal Zolkarnain. Yes, we know Mustafa right. Kamal. Yeah. Our friend Mustafa yeah. Kamal. <laughs> <laughs> so he says that Hi science Mustafa. is the key to resolving solutions breaking down virtual data barriers. So it's a giving statement. Yes. So okay, there's another one is Eleanor from T Systems Malaysia. A point to consider in data strategy for local authority, district and relevant ministries. So there's only two statements two and points. also ideas yep. from our yep. virtual along the line that we along are talking the about. Yep. Yeah. What about the role of uh, religious leaders? Ah, religious leaders I feel sometimes not pay playing a big in bigger role. They can because th they have a captive audience uh, every week. And then they have all this chirama chirama line that there's uh, this captive audience. And if they can instill those values, um, instead of just talking about uh, religion, uh, I'm not saying religion is not important, but part of being, um, um, part of that spirituality is also to look at uh, where you are in this world, you know, and that is part of that um, ecology. Mm. I've, did, I've done some digging up. 98.5% 98, huh? 98 of the Malaysian population has a religion, either okay. being a Muslim. All right. or yes, yes, so yes. I'm also yes, thinking along this uh, Friday yeah. sermons, mm. uh, Sunday sermons for the Christians. Mm, mm. So if scientists can also link up with some of the religious mm, leaders, mm. get some of the simple facts and figures into mm, sermons. Mm. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. And also encourage them. Yeah. Because all this uh, uh, value of not throwing your, your tissue paper is part of your religious consciousness. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Also, almost all religion will say that, hey, to their yeah, believers, yeah. hey, you are the stewards of the yes, earth. You must yeah, take care. Yeah, yeah. So in a way, sure. a lot of challenge. We mm. need to break down all the barriers that had been mentioned by Mustafa Kamal. Yes. But who to stand up first and do the breaking down of barriers? Mm. Mm. <laughs> In Malaysia, we say ladies first. Ladies. <laughs> oh, you're right, eh, Mazgin. You are right. You know why? The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And they don't say this for no good reason. Yeta. Because you teach your child from the time. Uh, he or she is in the cradle, uh, suckling uh, to the cradle. Uh, when they go, the first time that they are walking to the uh, playground, you can tell them if you see something, you pick it up, you throw it away. You know, and it is the woman who's always at home who will talk about waste management. Uh, of course, economic management. You know, uh, of the of your expenses, what food to eat, what food not to eat. Yeah, and the songs that the mom sings. Yeah, to the yeah, yeah, song. yeah. But Maslin, I think we, we I, I have an idea. So this is going to be a mother's movement. How about it? <laughs> Five more minutes. Any last uh, comment? Ah, yes, one gentleman at the back there, please. Is that Doctor Hafian? With the with the mask, yeah, with I the mask. I don't recognize anybody. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Dr. Prof. Salam. So my question is, uh, Hafia. what's your advice for the young scientists uh, embarking on, you know, sustainability journey as we are actually uh, creating our footsteps on searching, uh, on making a place, a, a better world? Uh, that's all for me. Thank you. Okay. Fortunately, I was young once. <laughs> <laughs> So remember I talked about uh, the urban uh, program with Sham Sunny. We were all young then. And so, so why I'm bringing that up is because nowadays uh, people 
think that without millions of ringgit in grant, it's not possible to do anything. Because um, you, you think I, I need this money in order for me to publish and whatnot. And I'm saying that at that time, we, we didn't have any grant. We actually put our money on the table so we could publish mm. and help young people to put publications, uh, have publications because uh, we, we published our own books. And nowadays, people will look down on that because they say, oh, unless you publish at Nature, uh, this is not good enough. So, so there are two things here. One is you can do a lot without millions of ringgit, as long as you're creative and innovative and you know exactly the problem you want to solve. Yeah, I talked about air pollution and, and, and water pollution. And the other thing is, young people, huh, your publishing in nature is not going to solve the, the country's problems. It is what you see as the country's problems and how are you going to solve it? And you got to work, knock on people's doors. That's what we used to do. We knocked on policymakers' doors. Uh, we went to PPBD, um, so that they get an awareness of what you know. So the young people, with all your energy, uh, muslins and my shoes are already <laughs> worn out. Uh, our shoes are worn out. But you have new shoes. Go ahead. Talk to the policymakers and don't for one instant think that that publication you have in nature is what defines you. Your age, sorry lah, your age, what is it, index does not define you as a person in a developing country, still developing country like Malaysia. I know I'm against the grain, I know most vice chancellors will say, but yeah, that's, that's what I believe in and um, I'll always say that, Maslin. If I can catch the keywords within that advice is leadership and volunteerism. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Not only leadership must happen at the top level, at your own level. At and the from you, it's level. coming that leadership yep. should come from you. Yeah. Uh, one minute that to, to yes. wrap up. Right. Right. Last words. Advice. Okay. May maybe because we are finishing off of this leadership issue, huh? and I want to address the young people here. Okay, you, you remember this picture of the uh, is it geese that are flying that in, in V shape, you know, beautiful. And the, the, um, the words there are always like that. This is le real leadership. Why? Because as, as the geese fly, the leadership, the leader actually changes according to the drafts and where they're going. Now, this is how you need to look at leadership. You need not look at Maslin alone because he is a DG, uh, the director of Lestari. But your own, the own, your own leadership, what do you, uh, ca what you can bring uh, as your own responsibility to make our country better? Thank you so much, Dato. So please join me in uh, thanking Dato Mazlan Osman in the usual manner. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Uh, we ha and 10 seconds to spare, Mazlin. Yeah, we are doing seven well. Seconds. Seven seconds, not Back five. Back to the Madam <laughs> MC. Terima kasih. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dato. Thank you very much, Yang Berbahagia Dato, Dr. Mazlan Osman. I am interested with what you have mentioned about women just now. And yes, I've heard once, um, educate a woman and then you educate a nation. <laughs> Thank you for the inspiring uh, for inspiring us today with such insightful sharing in today's urban talk, and we would like to invite Nima Bagirato and um, Doctor Prof uh, to take a picture with all of us today oh. on the floor. Down there. Okay. Yes, right. on the floor. Thank you. Yeah. Socially distancing. Nima Bagirato, your camera. Ah, thank you.